Welcome back to Manufacturing Talk Radio. Welcome to Manufacturing Talk Radio. In this half hour, we're going to be talking about the Dodd-Frank Act. We have with us our senior international correspondent, Adriana Sanford, who holds a Juris Doctoral Dual LLM in Tax and International Comparative Law. Welcome, Dr. Sanford. Thank you. Question, Dr. Sanford, a quick explanation for our audience. Dodd-Frank and the whistleblower situation. What is it? Why was it created? Dodd-Frank basically has a it has provisions for corporate governance and executive compensation and disclosure provisions. But on top of that, it also set forth provisions for a whistleblower program. Uh, the whistleblower program is for the publicly traded companies. It's a way for the SEC to obtain information on fraud and to be eligible for the reward you need to be able to provide the office of the whistleblower, which is within the SEC. You need to provide them high-quality original information that actually leads the SEC to an enforcement action. So let's talk about manufacturing for a moment, uh, Dr. Sanford, and whistleblowers. Uh, There's a whistleblower and a major manufacturer. In fact, uh, the latest report I read on the F-35C, the most advanced fighter jet in the world. There's some 1,800-plus counterfeit parts they found in the supply chain. We don't know why they're in there. But assume that the whistleblower stumbles across this in a manufacturer. What are they looking at? Are they looking at the whole enchilada, or are they just looking at uh, they stumbled over something and they're not quite sure what they're looking at? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. It depends. The answer depends on who that person is, what their position is. They may be seeing a tip of an iceberg. They may be seeing the whole iceberg. And that makes a big difference. According to the reports, the, the sources, the inside the mind of the whistleblower, they say that 92% of reports actually go inside the company first. These are individuals, employees that go up the chain and say, hey, there's something wrong. And out of those, only 20% ever choose to report outside the company. So you can imagine there's a lot going on that no one really knows about, and it's internal. Those that choose to report, let's say you don't see the tip of the iceberg. Let's say you see the entire iceberg. Well, those that report that actually go outside the company are those, 82% of those report the crime if it was big enough so they saw the iceberg, or if keeping quiet would actually harm someone. It would harm the shareholders, it might harm the company, or it might harm the consumers or the public at large. So we're talking about individuals that can't stay quiet for whatever reason. We're not talking about somebody who's looking for a monetary reward, but rather the majority of those that actually choose to speak about this or report it are individuals that are concerned. Maybe there's a cover-up. Or maybe this is creating personal liability on them because of the multi-jurisdictional requirements from the laws of other countries where they must report. Uh, uh, speak to for a moment the multi-jurisdictional requirements from other countries where they must report. What What is involved there? The issue there is that what we're seeing is a growing convergence. We have simultaneous prosecutions. We're not only looking now at an issue of maybe counterfeit. We're looking at why is the counterfeiting taking place? Is it supporting terrorist financing? If you have a money laundering issue and you happen to be in Singapore, Malaysia, or the Philippines, their laws require you to report or you have your very own money laundering offense. If we're dealing with another type of corruption, maybe we're dealing with bribery. We have the extraterritorial reach of the FCPA if you're a U.S. company. We have the U.K. Bribery Act. But also, we have 41 other countries under the OECD that have agreed to change, amend, or create their own laws for corruption. Brazil is different from ours. So their extraterritorial effect and what it states will impact our employees personally as well as the companies. Uh, Dr. Sanford, when we're talking about manufacturing, of course, we're talking about everything that comes into the manufacturing operation and in uh, receiving uh, everything that supply chain professional sources from somewhere all the way up to the C-suite where the corporate executives are. And you've mentioned on several of our shows 
that you could end up with your own money laundering offense leveled against you or other charges leveled against you. Does that extend beyond the corporate officer role down to where a supply chain manager or supply chain person might have personal risk? Personal risk is coming from new legislation being drafted everywhere. We have personal risk for our third-party vendors, for our, for our suppliers, uh, with regards to human right-related risks right now. That's coming up here in the U.S. and it's in the, in the, uh, in the U.K. as well. We're also seeing it in, in cybersecurity. We're seeing it can range, you know, your third-party vendors can range from being global companies to very small companies. So suppose for a moment that I am an employee and I've discovered what I, I don't know if it's the tip of the iceberg or I don't know or if it's the whole iceberg, and I'm getting this kind of pushback as I try to move it up the chain of command and say, hey, I think we have a problem here. I'm getting pushback. What do I do? That's a good question. Well, you've been hired to do a specific job. You've discovered something. You've discovered the tip of the iceberg, or maybe you've discovered something a heck of a lot bigger. You discovered the iceberg. You don't know what to do. You, you have not been hired to be a whistleblower. You need to hire and retain your own counsel, somebody separate from the company, that you can go to who specializes in this area and can advise you. That's step one, because only then do you know that you're getting appropriate advice. The in-house counsel is somebody you can talk to as well, depending on what you're seeing. depending if, if you've got the iceberg in your hands, I suggest you immediately go and retain counsel, outside legal counsel. Some employees, what they do is they feel more comfortable, if their boss is not listening to them, is they will report it to HR. The problem with reporting it to HR is HR doesn't know how to manage these issues. They don't understand money laundering. They don't understand what they have in their hands. You need somebody in there that can actually analyze the big picture and report the problems in a way that will actually help enhance the reporting, educate the employees. You know, maybe you need to make sure that you're instituting a process where anonymous reporting of tips comes through and a well-organized system to assess them. Some companies don't know how to do that. IHRM is one strategic role. Uh, Dr. Sanford, if I'm an employee and I discover what I think is either the tip of the iceberg or the iceberg, um, I was just reading an article in the newspaper today about a gal who, in fact, stumbled across something, reported it up the chain of command, and within a week or two they started writing negative comments in her file. They downgraded her pay. They gave her lousy shifts, and eventually she left the company. Um, what do I do to protect my primary income if I stumble across something that I feel like I, I'm going to have to blow the whistle on? Well, this is, this is a very big concern, actually. And what the ratios show is that one in five individuals experience retaliation after reporting. So one in three don't report internally because they fear that retaliation. What I would suggest, depending on how high up you are, because if you're a senior executive, there are certain steps you must take or you have your very own personal liability. But let's say you're, you're further down. You're a junior employee or you're the scapegoat. You're the person that they're telling or to raise the numbers and you don't feel comfortable. What I suggest you do is you join a charity and you ask for letters of recommendation. And if possible, you leave the company and then you blow the whistle. I've seen people do that, and it's a lot safer for their career. The issue is if it's something bad, you have to report it. The question is how and when, but if you're not senior, there may be a way for you to quickly leave. But that information is important, and especially today given our issues with global security. You may not know what you have in your hands. You may not understand that piece of the puzzle, and only the regulators can see it. But the problem is, the regulators don't have that internal roadmap. So unless this information is shared, they can't put the puzzle together, which is one of the reasons the government is now incentivizing whistleblowers. Now, Dr. Sanford, I understand there is a federal office of the whistleblower. What are they and how do they help us? Sure. there is. It's called the Office of the Whistleblower, and the chief right now is Sean McKessie. 
And what basically you can look them up online, and there's a little place where you can click to report, and you can make your report, and they can follow up. There are also other agencies where you can report. You can report to the FBI. You can make a formal report uh, to the DOJ. But again, before you start doing this, I would suggest that you retain counsel to make sure that you follow the correct steps, especially if you're in a senior position. You want to get that counsel uh, advising you as soon as possible. Okay. Dr. Stanford, you've referred several times to uh, retaining legal counsel. I assume I'm not going to run out to my real estate attorney and explain my problem. What kind of background does this lawyer need to have? The background of this counsel, you have to check very carefully. Just in the same way that if you're going to go in for heart surgery, you're not going to pick them out of the phone book. The same thing goes for when you're retraining someone to actually protect you and uh, advise you on whistleblowing. There are whistleblowers. There's a lot of different attorneys out there that will actually brag and will tell you, you know, how good they are at this. Just in the same way that you're going to look for the very best heart surgeon, you're going to have to do your research. Talk to your friends, talk to family, and try to find the best person out there. A lot of times someone will tell you, yes, I can advise you, yes, I can represent you, yes, I understand the issues. You have to put things in writing and say, this is number one priority. This is what I want to do. Because sometimes what will happen is they may know the company and settle and settle your case without your involvement. And all of a sudden you're getting a monetary reward when really the reason you're blowing the whistle was not for that reason. You didn't want to settle. You wanted to bring this information up because it's going to hurt the company or it's going to hurt the shareholders or it's hurting the public. So that's, that's the main concern that I see is make sure that when you retain counsel, you retain control of your own case. And do these tend to be corporate attorneys, uh, people with, with corporate law as their uh, specialty? Well, they're going to have to understand corporate law because they're going to have to understand the fraud. They should also be individuals that understand the big picture, that can understand the global implications. That's what we talk about, you know, looking at this from a global perspective. And if your attorney is not somebody that really understands multi-jurisdictional issues, you've got the wrong person if you're dealing in a multi-jurisdictional context. Now, if I am an employee and I'm just a line manager, I, I have no corporate title, I'm not a senior or an executive with the company, do I have any liability if I keep my mouth shut and later it all gets exposed? You could in other countries. It depends on the situation. Yeah. And, and the issue there is if you know and you're quiet, not only could you get fired, you could get arrested. Whether or not you're released later is a different story. That whole experience um, could be traumatizing. It could be tied to terrorism. It could be tied in so many other ways. So you've got to be careful. Now, Dr. Sanford, is there any particular uh, group of people within an organization that where this tends to... Uh, be exposed the most frequently, you know, supply chain or senior executives, or is it just all over the board? It's all over the board, but your senior executives are always exposed because they need to know what's going on in their company. And to the extent they don't, they're still liable. So this is one of the biggest concerns that multinationals have, especially when the laws in different countries are changing. They're constantly changing. Is there any international body, uh, you know, I feel like a, a Star Trek fan in the United Federation of Planets uh, that's looking at the corporate laws and trying to get the corporate laws of 40 or 50 different countries in line with one another. There are a lot of groups out there that are trying right now to do this. This is hot. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes right now. As I mentioned in the last show, the Microsoft case brought to light the multi-jurisdictional conflicts that exist between the EU and the U.S. with regards to turning over data. And we understand that the U.S. and the EU are going to revise or amend their agreements so that there are no conflicts in the future. That has not happened yet, but I'm told it will, they will, they will be working on this. But this is popping up in a lot of different areas. 
the International Enforcement Law Reporter is a good source to go to to get information on what is hot and what is changing. Bruce Garris is the editor of the International Enforcement Law Reporter. That's a good source. There are a few other sources out there. I know the Institute for Supply Management also has magazines. Those also help you stay on top of certain issues, but there's not one source. And you just have to realize and you have to be careful where you step and be aware that things may be changing. Uh, Professor, you you brought up uh, about Microsoft, and a couple months ago we had a, a, a show with you about the Microsoft and the uh, the Dublin email issue. Is and you did just brought it up as well. Are they making any major progress on that? Well, we're still we, waiting. We're it's still in the process, but everybody has their eye on it. And and the good news is that we realize that this is a problem. If we can come together and sit at the table and draft something that our multinationals can use, this is one less problem, one less legal or ethical dilemma for our executives. Remember, it's data protection, it's money laundering issues, it's, it deals with counterfeiting. So if you're doing spring cleaning in your company, a lot of new and diverse legislation out there, so you might think of hiring some individuals to, that are tailored, that specifically tr- are trained in these areas and can help manage your company. Well, we want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Sanford for joining us today in this discussion about uh, whistleblowing and, and updating us on the, the Microsoft Dublin email situation. Dr. Sanford, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you as well. And, great, and that wraps us up for today's show of Manufacturing Talk Radio. We appreciate the opportunity to be the voice of manufacturing globally and hope that you'll turn in and listen to us again next week. Thank you for listening. Thanks for joining us on Manufacturing Talk Radio. You can hear our next broadcast each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at mfgtalkradio.com.